is looking at animals. And in particular, we're going to be looking at um, uh, things up in the air, aerial, and things that, that crawl along the surface of the sediment or the soil. And we would refer to those as epigeal uh, critters. Mostly we're going to be seeing insects, but we will definitely get, uh, hopefully, um, I have no doubt that we'll get at least some, and we might get a lot of spiders, um, possibly some ticks and stuff. And so, so we therefore talk about these guys as arthropod focused methods. Um, occasionally, every once in a while in a pitfall trap, we might occasionally get a, a fence lizard or something. So we sometimes get vertebrates, but primarily this is an, an insect sampling endeavor. And I should say, I'll just, I'll just ramble on. Uh, so, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm still not used to these large group teaching. I'm used to Zoom meetings with colleagues, but I'm not used to classes. So if I'm not saying something and you guys try waving at me, uh, uh, yell at me. Go ahead and unmute yourself and just scream and say something because uh, I might might miss your question. But please feel free to interrupt me whenever you like. Okay. Why is this not letting me go? Okay. So this is what it looks like right now if we were down in San Diego and Point Loma. And we have these areas that are uh, blocked off. And obviously, you guys are all home. We can't we can't be at, at our at our main uh, typical assessment sites. Um, this technique that we're going to learn would work in a context like this. Sometimes, when we think about all of these um, challenges that we face, and um, when we're talking about assessing ecosystems, a lot of times. Uh, people first think about the big sexy things, the flashy critters, the ones that are very colorful or are very large. And while those are obviously important things uh, and, and, and sometimes easier things in some contexts to measure, most of our assessments tend to not focus on those. As you guys have been learning and hearing about what um, uh, Brenton and, and our other faculty do, uh, you know, we, we tend to focus on, uh, it'd be great to get the giant shark but typically we're focusing on these little gobies and things of that nature. So small critters are usually where a lot of the action is. And just to be clear, this is not busy work that you guys are doing right now. This is real science, so, so don't question this. This isn't a made up assignment. We're doing the exact same thing we would be doing if we didn't have the corona shutdown, just in maybe a slightly different place, but the techniques are all identical. Um, and sometimes we like to get flashy and, and, and fancy, <laughs> But um, this technique and these series of techniques are very uh, non-flashy. For any type of assessment that we do, whatever the technique is, um, this is the ultimate. We can't always get there, but this is what we'd like to be able to do. And this is, I believe, what your challenge um, has been set forth in front of you to do, which is to, to take the pulse of your backyard, of your front yard, of the lake, of whatever the area is around your home. And so this is a, an image that I modified from a paper called Hobbes and Norton, that, a sort of famous paper about thinking about how we assess ecological restorations. But the idea is this. So on the x-axis, we can call it time. If you want, in the context of doing a restoration or a management action, that could be age since you, you, time since you started that action. On the y-axis, it's some measure of structure or function. Um, it could be biodiversity, it could be reproductive rate, it could be whatever. The key point is on the x-axis, we're going from on the left side, low or young, to a larger number or, or farther in time to the right. And on the y-axis, we're going from a low level to a high level. So first look at the green line. So the green line is what we'd like to have. A green line is our target. A green line is our goal. And so typically that would be a, if we we're looking at forests, that would be a healthy forest. If we're talking about a reef, it would be a well-functioning, um, intact reef, that kind of thing. And so all of our ecological systems vary a bit over time. There's always, there's storms and there's seasons and stuff. So there's always some amount of play. But generally speaking, um, our, our reference sites, our target conditions have a relatively high level of functioning. In contrast, the pink line, the line at the bottom, uh, that would be a, a degraded system. And, that, and in the context of our management action, that could also be considered a failed management action where we've done something. And again, as we go through time, there's a bit of noise, there's some up, there's some down, but overall, it's not changing much. And overall, that level of function is, is quite low. 
what we'd like to see with our with a successful intervention, a successful restoration or, or introduction or whatever the case may be, we'd like to see that we start at that low level of functioning. And over time, we become indistinguishable from the green line. We become indistinguishable from the reference condition. So what we're going to be doing with this exercise is we're going to be looking at um, one metric or a couple different metrics um, for uh, the functioning of your of your um, native plant area or your planter box or whatever the case may be. So the first thing to be a useful metric, we need to be able to statistically distinguish the green from the pink. If we can't, that metric isn't particularly helpful. So first and foremost, there has to be uh, a signal that we can perceive. And, and a lot of times that, that might be enough. That, that, would, that would signal this would be a useful uh, metric or a useful methodology for us in terms of our assessment. But I would suggest to be really useful, particularly in this time of, of increasing climate change, this time of increasing weight of the footprint of humanity and things are getting uh, crazier and crazier by the day, um, to be really useful, we'd, we'd like there to be um, the ability of this metric to follow the orange line that we see there. So the orange line is showing recovery, but orange line is also, um, uh, if we look at the right-hand side of this graph, or sorry, let's start on the left. If we start on the left-hand side, our orange condition, our, our management action is indistinguishable from pink, right? It, it's no different from pink, but it is different from green. And if we go to the right on this figure, what we see is the orange dotted line is uh, uh, indistinguishable from the uh, uh, green solid line, right? So there we go. And at the same time, that orange line is also sati presumably statistically significantly different from the pink. But increasingly what we're finding is uh, traditionally that maybe took five years, 10 years, 15 years to, to get to that level of functioning. And usually the contract that you have if you're working for a firm, the, um, the permits that you have if you're a, a scientist, whatever it is, they don't typically... Uh, we're not typically funded for 20 years, right? And, and, and the public or the, the audience typically can't sit around for 20 years to figure out if orange is closer to green or if orange is closer to pink. So therefore, what we like these indices to be is really sensitive so that we can follow not just that green is different from pink, but that we can follow the slope of that recovery, the trajectory of that recovery. And so for that... Um, we'd like these metrics to be relatively sensitive. And so it's not, so first and foremost, we have to be able to distinguish healthy from unhealthy or well-functioning from, from poorly functioning. But then also, hopefully, this metric is sensitive enough that we can discern the intermediary stages and we can say, ah, well, it's only been three years and we don't know yet, but it looks like we're on the right track. Or alternatively, oh my gosh, it's three years in and we see no evidence of, of heading towards that functional equivalency. And, and so that might motivate us to, um, to modify, to adapt our management, to do something else, to put more water on the plants, to, to uh, you know, whatever the case may be. So, so that, that's that question. Yeah. Yeah. Go Jocelyn. Is the green line come from baselines? Yes. Yeah, so a great question. So that, that's a whole other lecture. So the green line could, could come from some, um, static baseline, or it could come from the literature. Um, it could come from historic records. It could say, ah, oh, you know, this, this place was turned into a Walmart parking lot, so we don't know what it was, but we read a report from 30 years ago that said it was a seasonal wetland, let's say. So you could get that data from there. Um, more typically, we use uh, similar sites in the, well, I don't want to say more typically, but I'd say um, uh, fairly common in places like Southern California where we've obliterated a lot of the reference condition, the, the systems that we're trying to make more of. Um, in those cases, a lot of times we will find a reference site. And so that site may be quite far away, but we would be monitoring, say, uh, let's give a specific example. So in the, if we're talking about Magoo Lagoon, the wetland there, let's say we're trying to restore some of that wetland. That green line could have come from some old studies in the 70s, let's say. And so maybe that, that's where we're, how we're uh, determining what that level is. Alternatively, maybe we can go up to Carpinteria Salt Marsh up north. Maybe we could go down to 
um, some wetlands down in LA or Malibu Lagoon or somewhere else and, and average those or look at the range. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. So yeah, again, this is conceptual. So, 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 um, so that, that, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And indeed that was, um, th that, that's a whole class. We could spend an entire semester just talking about how you might go about creating that green. It is not intuitive. Um, most folks think it's super obvious. It, there are many complicating factors, primarily complicated by the fact that we've fragmented and degraded most of our ecosystems. So for the most part, where you guys will be working in your career, it won't be some pristine, 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 pristine place, and then a little bloop, a little little damaged place. It'll be a matrix of areas of different levels of degradation. And so that makes um, formulating that green non-trivial. But the public always thinks, oh, it's just a, you know, Blah, blah, blah. So it, uh, you will spend a lot of your time thinking about not just the metrics, but also um, what you're going to be comparing your metrics to. And, and just before we end this, I'll say that is a really important thing. 20 years ago, we didn't put that much time into this. Now we put a lot of, uh, I think appropriately so, attention on the appropriate level of that green line. And that, that's, uh, that's a good thing. Cool. Any other questions about that conceptual intro? Okay. Um, so even though we're not originally when we talked about this exercise, we were going to do this in Camp Park, and I want to talk just a little really quickly about um, about why that why we were going to work there, and it, it's on campus, so that's nice. But but also why we're going to work there. But I also would just note that these techniques that you're doing in your backyard are really really important because our world is change. Our world has always been change, but in particular, the actions of our species are inducing greater magnitude and greater rates of change. So such monitoring that you're doing is really, really um, key. So this is campus in 2013 uh, during the Springs fire. And so, so you guys are familiar with Thomas fire, with the Woolsey fire and all those. This was the last fire that actually completely 100% burned up campus. It burned around campus. It didn't burn our main buildings. It didn't burn the faculty housing. Um, but, but everything else, hundred percent of everything else on campus burned, including hundred percent of Cam Park. And again, um, what we do in the context of a hurricane, what we do in the context of a wildfire is the same techniques that you guys are learning in this class, even though they just happen to be in your backyard. So, uh, as a quick example, we're not talking about fire here, but just to give you an idea, this is the burn scar. So the, 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 this is a false infrared image, but that red is all the area that burned. It started up um, by Camarillo Springs. It started up right here very early in the morning, and it blew very quickly. Um, it started in the early morning during commute time, and by mid-morning, campus was evacuated, and everyone was evacuated, and campus was on fire by midday. Um, and so there we are. And, and again, we talk about these techniques as being really, really important, um, and we sometimes overly focus on a disaster, but I think it's also important to realize that the, even though the, the frequency of these disturbances are changing, um, disturbance is always a part of our natural world. And so you can see that here, this is the night, this is um, obviously that's campus there. Um, so here are fires in the area, 1960, 1970, 1980s, uh, the 1990s, 2000s, not too many. And then we hit the Camarillo Springs fire. So we sometimes get lulled into having a five or 10 year or 15 year period where we haven't had a fire, haven't had a hurricane, haven't had an earthquake. And we um, uh, forget that, that doing monitoring in your own backyard is actually super, super useful because there will be some disturbance in your backyard at some point. And without that baseline, it gets hard to figure out where that green line um, should be or could be. This is campus on fire in 2013. And this is how it, it, it blew out. This, these are the uh, maps from the fire department. So these are um, on topo maps, but it blew out really quickly. It, it kept blowing. By 10 o'clock, it hit campus. Um, and so I, we're, we're zooming out. Each of these slides, we're going a little bit farther out. It ran all the way down to PCH. It hit the PCH at night. And then the next day, um, it ran back up into Newbury Park in Thousand Oaks. Um, so a uh, huge, huge fire. This is what campus looked like right after the fire. So you can see how the fire came right down exactly to the, the road edges on campus. This was um, uh, looking up um, sort of above the faculty glen uh, before the fire. And this is right after, same exact location. And again, this is looking down 
um, towards campus from the ridge above um, uh, Cam Park, and this is right after the fire. So pretty much, uh, you know, everything got torched. Um, and so we were doing this exact class. I was teaching this class. Um, and we had, it was springtime, just like it is now. We had gone out and we were doing all these techniques that you guys are doing um, and a few others. And you guys are doing some that we weren't doing. But based on this basic idea that we're going to talk about today, we were doing those. We put them all out. We put them all out the week and a half before the fire. So then the fire came and nuked the whole area. And we're like, whoa, let's go in and put those out. So I called the, the police chief and said, hey, can I get out and put some traps out? And he goes, no, absolutely not. So then I went out and put traps out. And, um, and it worked really, really well. And um, so after, and then they said, we saw you out there. Why were you being illegal? And I said, sorry. Um, and, and then, um, and then after, you know, a few days, uh, and they weren't, they weren't saying don't go out there because they're trying to screw science. They were just, as, as always happens in these situations, they were trying to secure the area, make sure there wasn't anything dangerous and all that, all that. And after about 10 days or so, it was clear that, um, you know, things had, that things were safe. And so we got permission. And so then our class went back in and we resampled this area. So we sampled just before and just after the fire, which is a really unique opportunity. And every so often after the, after this, we've gone back and sampled. So that was our, originally our plan. So that's fine. We'll just do it next year. That's cool. But, um, but uh, this is a, a really, you guys are a real cool part of a, a tradition. And, and this little one was from this fire, but we do all this kind of stuff. So this is one of your previous, one of your predecessor classes out there. Um, this was obviously just before the fire. So they're out sampling. And just like you guys uh, know that there's a lot of field work. And then after that field work, there's a lot of coming back into the lab and, and uh, either processing the samples and or entering all of that data. And this is from our, at the time, our only lab, which is which was next to the music room in Malibu Hall. So um, this is exactly like, uh, it's ex I, I tell you, it's a little, maybe a little more spacious in your house, but this is exactly like doing this science in your house. So this is no different. So um, I think once every, honestly, probably every 10 days, I got an angry call or email saying that we clogged the bathroom sink with soil and dirt, because that was the only sink we had. And and the band people were angry that they couldn't wash their hands after they went to the bathrooms. There was twigs in the sink and all that kind of stuff. So, so I, I totally know where you guys are, where we all are, and we'll get through this. And this is, this is classic uh, ESRM um, for better or worse. Okay, so this is what we're doing. So we're doing two types of um, uh, two, two different techniques. One is focused on the flying insects. One is focused on the, the crawling insects or, or arthropods. And... Um, uh, we'll talk about how we do this. Now, what I'm showing you is our default methodology. So if we'd been on campus, this is what we would, um, this is what it would look like if we put out an array. Obviously, um, we had some, we've had some challenges. We weren't allowed to send you guys equipment for legal reasons. Um, and so we've had to mail things from you. And it turns out the company that makes this, this yellow thing, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, the, the sticky trap, that they, they are currently shut down. So, so we're giving you an equivalent thing, very similar. It's just not quite this exact dimension. Um, but we have some things pointed up in the air. We have some stuff on the ground. And this picture is from uh, after the burn scar, so you can see what's going on. Now, typically, um, we use a taxonomy-based approach when we do these assessments, right? So when 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 um, you guys are going out, you, you know, you probably need to tell us what the species of that of that plant is and and all that good stuff and and we believe very strongly in natural history the foundations of natural history being able to identify this tree identify that insect etc and most folks would take this approach so when we said hey we're going to go count insects they would say okay great and we go catch the insects and then the default thinking is that i think i think traditionally is that we would sit there and with a with a dichotomous key, we would key out all of these uh, insects. When I've and, I, and my background is in marine biology, and um, so when I went up for my postdoctoral fellowship, which was up at um, uh, Stanford University, it was to do grassland restoration. And I was doing a lot of restoration, but I not really worked in grasslands. So I was like, "This is great! I'm going to learn about grasslands." I go up there, and there's a gazillion million insects in the grassland, right? And I don't. I wasn't trained as a as a um, insect ecologist, so I knew a little bit, but you know I didn't know everything. And so 
I sent an email to a, a famous museum up in the Bay Area, and I said, hey, look, I have to do this grassland restoration, and I'm, you know, I got the plants covered. I can figure out the plants, okay, but the insects really have me vexed, right? The, um, um, Darwin said famously that uh, God must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles because there's so many different types of beetles, right? Um, and so I emailed these guys. I said, hey, can you guys help me with the taxonomic problem? They said, sure, what is it? And I said, well, I need to... I need to um, uh, enumerate and count and identify these insects in a field. And they said, oh, what field? And I, I told them where it was. And they said, so you want to send us a couple representative samples? And I said, well, no, I can send you some representative samples, but I need to assess this ecosystem and I want to assess it over time, how it responds. So I'm looking for someone that can help me identify insects every time I go out and trap insects. And this was a direct quote from my email and what, what they this person said was, your inquiry is naive at best. And they said a lot of bad words about me. And it says, and then they went on to say, if you really want to do this project, which was a, a, a several year ecological restoration proposal, if you really want to do this project, you need 20 years and expansive funding to do one acre of grassland. And that really made me very angry because I would love to have expansive extensive funding, and I would love to have it for 20 years. It ain't happening. It ain't happening. Even in, in famous, wealthy, rich Stanford with all kinds of money and resources and stuff, they didn't have they, they didn't have that money, right? And so while it would be wonderful to have that, we live in the real world. You guys live in the real world. And we have to make progress with usually very limited um, time frames and usually limited funding. And so... Um, so what are we going to do? And so what we came up with is um, is what you see here. So this this is the this is a trap. This trap has been out for five days. This sticky trap, and each of those little things isn't a seed or 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 a piece of dirt or something. Um, those are all different uh, insects. And um, what are we going to do? So we could get every single one of those insects, and we could hire an uh, you know an expert, and he or she could tell us exactly what each of those species is. Because insects in particular are so diverse, if we had, if we want to know what the fishes were like, you could hire Brenton. If we wanted to know what the birds are like, we could hire uh, one of our colleagues from the Western Foundation for Vertebrate Zoology, whatever, and they can they can do a great job at that. Insects, though, are so diverse, virtually nobody is an expert in everything that you'd see here on the screen. So there's going to be the grasshopper expert that might be in Kansas. There's going to be the butterfly expert that might be in San Diego and so on and so forth. So if we were to do one of those more traditional taxonomic assessments, we would first do our collection of these organisms, bin them into different uh, uh, taxonomic groups, and we might have our guesses or, or our best estimates, but then to be sure, we would have to mail, break up each of our, each of our uh, sample collections and mail them to all these different places. And those folks, generally speaking, don't get paid. And so that's, they're gonna receive those samples, they're gonna sit on their desk and they might take a month to get to them, they might take a year to get to them. Um, because again, they're doing it for, um, generally speaking, free. And so so that's not practical. Just like the challenge you guys have been given, you're doing an assessment, you have a limited time, ready, set, go. And so what, we've decided, what we decided to do was look at um, uh, morpho species diversity. So apparent diversity and the most conspicuous groups, we can do those, right? So some, some stab at um, taxonomy, but we're not trying to go down, generally speaking, to the species level, with the possible exception that if we knew we had some, say, endangered species, maybe we would want to be very careful and look for those. But um, but so what do we do? Well, we started putting out traps. And when I started doing this, I, I, I didn't know anything about this. And so we started doing various experiments. And, and here is um, a key thing that's going to determine how you guys deploy your sticky traps, the aerial traps. So normally you're just going to put, we normally just put out one, one trap at any one, you know, specific location. This thing here is a giant PVC pipe and every 10 centimeters, there's a trap affixed. And we, we've done that a few times and it's a fantastic thing to do in this class. If, if we had, you know, if we had everybody around and we had time, maybe we'd do it this semester, but, but basically we put these traps up and without getting into any statistics or whatever, on the right is what we found. So we, we cover the traps with saran wrap when we're done so we can process them and so that the, so things are preserved and that they don't stick to our hands as we go to the car and stuff. And what you see is, um, again, no statistics, just looking at it, 
Um, stuff up high, there's a few there's a few critters that that are you know a meter several meters above the ground, but almost everybody is in that first trap, right? The the greatest abundance, the greatest diversity we consistently find, whether it's a wetland, a grassland, wherever, is are are from the traps that are very close to the ground. So when you guys deploy your traps, that's the that's the height that we're going to deploy it at. That's where we're going to get the most bang for the buck. There could be a particular species that only flies super, super high off the ground that we would be missampling. But again, we always have to make trade-offs in these. And then the best one is to go relatively close to the ground. Uh, and this just shows some of the data that, that proves it as we, that, that both um, the, the biomass is high and, and uh, sorry, on the um, uh, y-axis, that's height above ground. And so we see the peak of all these things, productivity, biomass over time, uh, relative richness, everything peaks as we get near the bottom, or excuse me, get, get near the ground. Uh, generally speaking, these are also very safe techniques. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but this methodology really works all kinds of places. So on the top, on the top, actually both these pictures are from some wetlands. And what you see up there, we have a camera trap, right? So the wooden stake, there's a camera trap in the upper picture, same thing in the lower picture. And, uh, and generally speaking, you put these traps out and they're fine. The one time we have had some issues is where we have um, baby birds. So baby birds that are naive, that don't know how to do anything yet. And um, sometimes we trap these big, fat, juicy moths and these big, fat, juicy bugs. And so these little baby birds are like, damn, I'm going to eat that. And they kind of go up. And, and because they don't know how to interact with things, they assume it's it's a, a stick or they assume it's a, uh, a leaf or something. And they might come and they might flap their wings too close and get their primary stuck on the stuck on the um, trap. And that's not good. So um, so the only modification you guys might choose to do from our default one is if you do think you have something really particularly sensitive, or if you have a puppy in the back that you take in your backyard or something of that nature, um, you might want to use uh, our modified technique, which is simply to put some, in, the, in this case, we've just used tomato cages, but you could use anything. But um, just put tomato cages around them. And we've done, this, we've done the background studies that show if you put a tomato cage around these traps, it does not affect the diversity or the density of critters getting on it, but it does prevent the, um, the little baby vertebrates from accidentally getting stuck to it. And, uh, and usually they, they won't get hurt, but they'll, they'll mess it up when they hit the trap. They'll break the trap and every once in a while they might get hurt. So, so as, assuming that you don't have any little baby birds around, assuming that you don't have a puppy run around your backyard, you can just put these traps out wherever you think you want to put them. If you are concerned, you can put a little, uh, a little you know, hoop essentially around them. Um, I have a question. Yeah. When we were working with these last semester, um, we caught a lot of Western fence lizards that would climb up the bottom and try to eat things and get stuck. Um, do you have a suggestion for not having that happen? Because just in where I live, we have yeah. a lot of those around. Yeah, no, great question. So what you could do is, I, I would, there's a couple different approaches, but I think the easiest one is to do similar things that the folks that are trying to keep squirrels off power poles do. And I would just get a, um, I would just get either, uh, say, a cup, a cup or uh, a bowl or a funnel, I guess, would go, but that would be a little more expensive, but but something of that nature. And I would I would put them so that the, so, how am I showing this? So that the, the spike, the, the, the holder would be like that, right? So that they would come up and they, it would, in theory, I suppose they could still crawl around, but they, they probably wouldn't. So I'd do something like that. What you guys will find, and so th this is our default methodology using these these uh, wire, using these wire hoops. Um, but what you'll find is because we couldn't get these for you guys, you guys are going to um, suspend your traps essentially with string or zip ties or something. So it should be even less likely that you guys would get those um, this time. Um, but but if you if you are going to use a, a a shaft or a a, a spike type of deployment i would you could try you could try that is that cool okay thank you yep could i use a rose stem Do sure you think a lizard would climb up that uh a lizard will definitely climb it i think i think i think yeah it's, the answer is you could totally use a rose stem uh, if it's thick enough they they yeah the the small herps might go up that thing okay other questions 
Cool. Okay, so again, this is this is what we're doing. And so um, so the sticky traps are just the sticky traps and, and our, our default methodology here. And, and again, what I'm gonna do when we're done with this and it stops raining, I'm gonna make a little, uh, I'll make my own little deployment video to show you guys and I'll post that up. And so, so in a few hours, you guys will be able to see what this looks like. But, but for now, I'll just say that you're gonna wanna have your sticky trap about, about one to the bottom of the trap one to two fists above whatever the discontinuity is. So in this picture right here, this is a burned area. If this was a salt pan, um, if this was a, a, a sand dune kind of thing, same thing, one to two fists and that's good. However, a lot of you guys are gonna be, be deploying these in, in a variety of vegetative areas, right? So maybe you'd have r rose bushes, maybe you have, um, a Brenton's uh, 3,000 foot tall uh, bird of paradise plant, or whatever, right? So the key thing is, um, there's it's not as if the insects are 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 attached to the ground, right? So so this wasn't because they were going along the ground. This is because, um, again, I'm a marine biologist by training. So when I started thinking about this, I thought, what are you talking about? Insects fly everywhere because they walk around, and the bastard goes in my mouth, you know, and uh, that's totally wrong. Very few go in my mouth, right? Most of them are, are going at my ankles, but I just don't perceive those ankles. So the way the physics of flight of most arth of most flying insects is this, is, is they fly close to a surface and they get lift off of that surface, whether they fly like a bee, whether they're, they're, they're you know, how, however their mechanism of flight is, they're using the ground. Um, to some extent to help get lift. And so they're, they're, they're going to be very close to whatever that surface is. So they're coming, they're close to the ground. If they hit, if they come to your hedgerow in your backyard, they're going to go like this. They're going to go up and they're going to still stay about the same distance, but they're going to go off of that surface. So the guide for, for one to two fists off is whatever the structure is. So if you have a shrub, that's that shoulder height, you know, the average height of the stems, I'm going to want to put that trap one and a, one to two fists above my shoulder height. If it's, if it's the height of my knee, uh, same thing. I don't want to put these guys one to two fists above um, uh, my knee height. And then the only other thing uh, that you would need with that is um, it's probably helpful to have, a, if, that, if that is the situation you have, have some little gardening shears or scissors because you do want to make sure that you clip away all of the like random sprigs of grass, so that if it gets windy, those sprigs of grass don't blow onto your surface. But uh, hey, Doctor, A, for uh, for sites like 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 mine, where you know I have I have a bunch of sporadic plants that are various various heights, and then I have a lot of like exposed soil and stuff like that. Would you put it one or two fists? Like above the soil in in between the vegetation. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Because because they're gonna. Yeah. So because if we imagine, if we imagine, you guys all see me. If we imagine this was, okay. So here's here's my two cups. But right now they're a couple inches separated. But we can imagine in um, Brenton's um, backyard, maybe maybe this the gap between these two is three feet or something. Those critters, it, it, if if the plants were literally this far apart, if they're only inches apart. Man, I would need another hand here. Uh, you know, they, they would go like brr, brr, and go right over. But if they're separated by, by you know, feet, here's my, here's my virtual insect. Can you guys <laughs> see me? I hope this isn't like a Me Too movement or something. Okay, so go like this. It's going to go, and they're going to drop down. They might not go all the way down to the ground, but they definitely are not going to be all up at this super high height. So, so to answer Brenton's question, what I would do is I would – I would try to pick an area that that has consistent elevation for at least you know half meter or so, and then and and that's probably how they're going to respond. So if it's within a couple inches, they're going to stay high, but 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 if they can drop down, they probably will drop down. So so ideally, a, a homogeneous site is where you would deploy these, and if it is heterogeneous, try to find as homogeneous a part of that of that patch. Cool. Um, okay, so so uh, looking back at this picture, this is the easiest example, right? This is this is everything is homogeneous, 
And so I'm going to put the tr my pitfall trap right next to this. Why not? It's in the same place. This thing is going to be – so when I'm walking – now, again, you guys are in your backyard, so it won't be hard to find these. But you can imagine if we were in Camp Park or we were out at Vandenberg or we were at some faraway place that, we, that you didn't have daily experience at, obviously you're probably going to drop a, a GPS point or something. But, but still, you know, is it over there or over there? So by having these two things together – um, it helps you relocate them, right? There's nothing magical. You could have that pitfall trap two meters away from this, but by having them together, you increase your probability of you being able to to find relocate them quickly. Um, and okay, yeah, and, and just 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 uh, since we're on this picture, I'll just say I'll just mention um, with the uh, with the uh, pit, pitfall traps. We'll talk about those in a second. But the pitfall traps are obviously going to go into the ground, so they're they're not up in the atmosphere. They are they are inserted into the matrix. Um, that's technically that's all you need. You just got to put a, a cup out, a, a catcher, a holder, right? But what you see in this picture is we have an additional thing. It could be a bowl, it could be a plate, some type of structure that's over it, and that's for two reasons. One, that's to make sure that um, uh, dirt and, and other substances don't get in there. If you get dirt in there, you can still process the samples, but it'll just take longer. So, so it's cleaner and easier if you have a, if you have a, a, a clean container. Um, secondly, we want to make sure that critters that fall in here, um, sorry, we're killing things, sorry. Um, but we, things that fall in here, we want to make sure stay in here. So we got to put something in here to make sure they die and they don't crawl out. If it were to rain, as it's doing this week, and, and we were to put a trap out that just was was out there, and we can imagine, you know, some of the areas around LA got eight inches in this last storm, which is crazy, crazy amount of rain up in some of the mountains. So you can imagine this little cup, if we got eight inches, it would be completely flooded, right? Now, if you guys go out and you do indeed discover your, your sticky trap has been ripped out by a bird or a neighbor or a kid or whoever, your brother or whatever, that sucks, but okay, you lost it. What we don't want to have happen is we don't want to go out and, and pull in a trap such as this that has not been trapping organisms that we assume had been and then go, oh, I didn't catch anything. So one of the things that will help with that is to make sure that no extra rainwater goes in here. So this cover also both keeps the trap clean and it keeps, um, it keeps it from being flushed out with rainwater. And then lastly, this little covering um, will... Uh, reduce the likelihood that a coyote or a neighborhood cat or whoever might come and kind of and kind of you know disturb your trap and either hurt themselves or hurt your data. So that's what's going on there. And then, uh, as you can tell from this photo, this guy is just separated about an inch. Let's see if I can show you guys. Uh, just about an, there's nothing magic about this, but just about an inch or so above the ground. And so that will allow all these epigeal insects to crawl and fall into it. But again, it'll it'll keep the vertebrates and the other folks from from disturbing it too much, and um, we we you can use these fancy hoops or whatever. But again, you guys will be creative. You could use whatever you want a, a wire coat hanger, a, a screw or a nail or whatever, just to make sure that 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 um, that covering doesn't fall down and, and seal off the trap from. Others. Okay, so this is what you guys need for your pitfall traps. The other thing that's neat about this technique is we're using solo cups. Everybody can get solo cups. Even, and I went and checked several stores yesterday, even in crazy Coronaville quarantine land, um, there might not be toilet paper in your store, but apparently people got don't need cups. Everybody's got cups in their house. So, so these are um, cheap, and the great thing is that they're all the same standard width. And so with this technique for the pitfall traps, the depth doesn't particularly matter. I would suggest you use these little, these more shallow, shallower ones. But if all you have are the deep, you know, red solo cups, and you're going to go listen to some country music and drink substances, um, uh, that's fine. You can use those. It's just, it's just, you know, it's, you have to dig a little bit deeper. But the key point is that the diameter here, which is the area with ultimately which with which we're sampling, is consistent. So that's great. So you can go into stores in Europe and find this size. You can go into stores in, in the Middle East and find this size. So this is one of the, one of the upsides of standardized manufacturing in our society. Um, so, so you just need a, a cup or, a, well, you need replicates, but you need, you need, for each trap, you need a cup. And that's really basically about it. So uh, I would recommend you guys have a little, um, uh, you know, a shovel, but if you actually don't have one, you can use your hand, right? Nothing fancy. 
I would generally not use a, a broad spade, a, a big, um, like the kind of shovel if you're digging a hole, because that's going to be, that's going to be doing a lot of digging and disturbing the ground that you don't need to do. So ideally a little trowel like this is the best. And, and you can just sort of dig a hole just wide enough to make the space and, and plop this guy down in, into it. And again, I'll, I'll show you guys this when I do the demo video. Key thing there is we just, once we put this in the ground, we wanna have a nice seal with all the soil right around the lip of this thing. So that critters walk, 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 walk. And once they go, oh crap, they're, they're over the cup as opposed to a gap between the soil and this where they might fall in and not be captured. Um, and then you just need some type of covering. Again, it, it could even be a paper plate for that matter. Although again, with the rains that we're having, at least here in Ventura County, you know, plastic, as much as I hate plastic, plastic is, is a useful thing here. Um, and then just something, in this case, I, in the picture here, I have some nails, just something to, to, you know, help you get this lifted off the ground surface. And then um, what we typically, use, what we've historically always used is antifreeze, right? So this is, this is a, does a couple things. So antifreeze doesn't evaporate in the summer. Typically, we're, we, this method, usually um, we conduct this in spring and in summer and in fall. And so it, it, particularly in Southern California or coastal California, it can be very hot. And so if you just put liquid, if we put, let's say water in here or something, um, it's gonna evaporate. We're gonna leave these deployed for five days is our goal, five day deployment. And so, so by putting antifreeze in here, that assures that the liquid doesn't evaporate. Also, antifreeze is colored. So it's, it's typically that, that bright green. And so when we look at this, when we go to pull it in, we can see if the trap has been disturbed. We can see if the, if the uh, cup is broken or if it's somehow rained or in the context of wetlands, if we had some seasonal or some uh, uh, tidal flooding that came in and accidentally you know, flooded our container, then we know, oh, this trap is a bust. And so that visual signal is very, very key. Um, now, or originally when I, I first invented this technique, we used, um, we used regular antifreeze, and then we started using the environmental antifreeze, which is vaguely less toxic, still toxic. Um, and the problem with both of those though, is that um, they taste sweet. So if your dog or a coyote were to taste it, because of the, the, the just random luck of the compounds that we use in there, it, it, it fires your, your sugar sensors in our, in our vertebrate tongues and it, um, ah, it kind of tastes okay. And so it could induce things like a coyote to maybe lap it up a little bit, which we don't like. So what we typically use is we use, um, if we're, if we were in, in, again, on campus, we would just give you guys some of this just default glycol. This is, this is food grade. So this is, if a coyote does get into your, our trap, it doesn't hurt him or her. Um, but, uh, but you guys can do the same thing with just some antifreeze. This glycol is, um, is clear. And so to use this, I would get a couple drops of food coloring and just droop, 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 again, to have that color signal. So when we go to pull this in, we know that it wasn't diluted with rainwater. The great thing about this technique is, yes, we're using antifreeze or, or whatever the substance is, but we rarely, if ever, use this and throw it away. Typically, we're gonna, when we're done, uh, five days from now, you'll, you'll go get your, your trap and you'll pull it out and you'll pour it into a mason jar here or whatever the container is you want to use, pour it in and, and, you know, probably labeled trap one, trap two, trap three, and then bring it back home or, or bring it in, <laughs> bring it your home, bring it inside, I guess I'll say, and then you'll process it at the end. Usually if we don't have a lot of dirt or sediment in there, it's totally fine to reuse. So you'll, you'll take your critters out as you enumerate them and then you just pour that stuff back. And so we've recycled coolant for three, four years, you know, so, so a couple gallons will last for a long time. So yes, this is a substance that maybe is not, you know, completely non-toxic, but we don't consume massive amounts of it. So it's, it's a great, it's a great technique. Um, and then the only other thing you might want to use if you were doing that to, to put the sample back and put the material back. Um, we, we like to have a funnel just because it's easy to, to put it back into a container. And, and this container on the left is a brand new one, which is great. Once I were to use that, if I were to, to now take my used stuff, I would create a new one and just say, hey, this is the used one. And after, you know, who knows, 10, 15 cycles through, maybe it's time to get some new stuff. So that's our, those are our pitfall traps. Sticky traps, so here's our sticky traps. So sticky traps, these are, um, 
these are pieces of just rigid plastic. Now this is how they come from, if, if you guys could, if we could have sent you samples from BioQuip, which is a biological insect supply house um, uh, south of us that are fantastic. They supply much of the world. They're, they're great to have, uh, they're so close to us. But this is just some rigid plastic, that's all it is. Then we take what's called Tanglefoot, which is a substance you can also order if you want. Um, and that's this nasty petroleum, super, 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 super sticky stuff. Um, and so, uh, so you can, if you buy it, you can make your own. You can take a, a plank, a piece of wood, and you could paint this stuff on it. These are made in a in a factory where they have these very fine emitters, and they. Pss they spray a very thin, very even coat of this stuff onto each side of these, these plastic traps. Tanglefoot is fantastic because it's sticky when it's super hot. It's sticky when it's below freezing. Um, and so it just stays sticky its entire uh, life. So that's why it's such a fantastic tool. And that's why people trapping insects use this substance so much. Um, now, uh, 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 we tend to use these, these particular size traps from BioQuip, and, but when we put them on this guy, when we put them on the trap, they're, they're tall and they'll do this, this exact thing they're doing in front of you, they'll flop. So what we will do is we'll take these, we'll cut them in half. So our default trap size is half of one of these blocks. And then it's such that the plastic is, is rigid and, and points up in the air. So again, our default method is to use that. The traps that you guys got, well, hell, let's look at it. Let's see what, what Emily just sent us. It's kind of like Christmas right now. Let's cut this open. Let's see what we got going here. I was gonna ask you that because I think the ones she ordered too are more rectangular as well. So if oh. they are, oh, they're actually smaller. Okay, so those are kind of good to go. Very exciting. Okay, so these are great. Um, and and so yeah, I think are these exactly in half the size? Uh, they're similar. They're, they're not the same size as our other ones, but they're very very close. So that's good. Again, this is this uh, petroleum-based substance. The material that's on this trap is a wax paper. And so uh, what you're gonna do is, on, uh, again, I'll make the how-to video, but you're, you'll, if you just go a little bit like this, and if you guys can see I can peel, right? I'm starting to separate it. Uh, that's all good. Get everything ready to go before you peel it off. Because as soon as this comes off, this is gonna stick to your shirt, and it's not gonna come off your shirt, and it's gonna, it's just gonna, it's gonna be stick to, stick to everything. So get your whole setup ready, do a dry run, suspend it, you know, do a practice suspension or however you think you're going to do it. If you guys are going to do something inventive with rose bushes or something, I would put this on the rose bush for an hour or so and make sure it's really going to stay up there. And then I'd launch it. And so launching it is just deploying these things. Now, when you're done, you could save these pieces of wax paper. And when we're done with our uh, trapping, you know, five days later, you could just put those pieces of wax paper on but we will not do that. Instead, we're gonna use saran wrap because we wanna be able to see through them so we can process the samples. Um, and again, and, and our default is, our is to use these little wire hoops, but you, can, you don't need to use these wire hoops. You guys will, will have them suspended. And it looks like in my box, she gave me these traps and some um, uh, zip ties, which is pretty much all you guys need. If I was going to do a zip tie, what you'll notice here is that uh, they have a um, hole punch in them. And this is because um, these are used uh, by folks doing, um, say, invasive or, or nuisance pest monitoring, um, you know, invasive species, things like that. So a lot of times they'll just hang them from a tree or from a, a garden area or, or, or the area near their uh, uh, um, organisms that they're growing. And so they'll be hanging down. Uh, and you guys, you guys can definitely do that. Um, one of the things that's nice about these, these guys here is that um, because it's just a symbol, excuse me, a simple uh, solitary point in the ground, if it starts to blow, this thing's going to go like this. Wah, it's going to orient to the wind. And then if it blows the other direction in a couple hours, it'll, wah, it'll orient to the wind. You guys might need to just because of the constraints of your system. You might work up something where it's it's more of a um, like a clothesline type of thing, and it's more it's more um, you know fixed in terms of the orientation. For this purpose of this, that's fine. Ideally, though, um, you'd want it to be able to move 
because that's actually going to be less likely to, as surprising as it sounds, less likely to tear. Um, and also, it, it's, it'll orient to the wind, and it'll be more likely to catch those insects that are going this way, right? So if it's, if it's rigid this way, and the, if, it's, if it's this way, and the wind is blowing from you towards me, you know, out of the computer towards me, um, and it's oriented this way, the insects are mostly going to go past it, right? So by having, having it, al allowing it to move freely, that's the ideal thing. If you can't, don't worry about it. But, but I probably would not take, I probably would not take my um, uh, super dangerous, uh, going to cut open my hand razor blade and just, and cut a slice in here and then put this through here because that's going to tend to rip it. I would uh, use a hole punch, or if I had to use this, I would do a circular hole with this so that so that it, it, it's not likely to tear and then fall to the ground. But but you guys you guys will explore. The only other option, or the only other thing that we've sometimes used, and again, you guys will have to determine this. Um, and so that, that's the default deployment. The default deployment is is put one of these little one of these little um, hoops and put one trap and you're done. And uh, you know, you guys are setting this up for the first time, so it'll take you a few minutes. But once you've done a couple of these, you can do one of these deployments, be it Sticky Trap or Pitfall, in, you know, 30 seconds or so. So they're also very, very fast. And you can, and, and always it's easier if you have a buddy, but you can do all these by yourself as well. So they don't require a lot of people. The, but the one thing I will say is if you are in an area where it's super windy, where it's just really, really windy, what we've noticed, and now if you guys are not using our hoops, you might be okay. But what we've noticed over the years, particularly in coastal bluffs and coastal plains where it's like Vandenberg or something, which is always kind of windy or consistently windy. So here it is right here. You can imagine it blows for a while. If it's blowing, you know, super, super hard for days and days on end, sometimes because of this, the rigidness of this metal, it can start to crack the plastic after a couple days. And so what, we'll, what I'll do is if I, if I know it's just going to be super windy and this is a site that we've, we've had problems with, I'm going to get uh, uh, either a cereal box uh, type of cardboard or an actual big thick piece of cardboard. And I'm going to, to uh, put one trap here and I'm going to double the traps up basically. I'm going to put one, tra one trap on this side and one trap on that side. And then I'm going to deploy that. And, th and this extra cardboard is enough to keep it rigid so that it, the trap does not break. In those cases, the th and again, you can use whatever you want, but what I found works best in those cases are these, these thicker clips. And we tend to clip those to, to a, a stake or, or some type of thing um, And uh, if, you, if you need that. Um, also, when I go out, uh, if I'm if I'm just going out to some random sites that I've not been to before, and I'm and and I, I know there's vegetation, you guys can use whatever you want. But our default is we take bamboo stakes. We take meter long bamboo stakes, um, and sometimes even longer. Sometimes two meter bamboo stakes. Indeed, and we've done some of the cattail sites at at Orman, which are you know way over our head. We've actually taken long pole, uh, you know, uh, 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 like three meter long. Uh, stakes. And so in those cases, I take duct tape, just like Brenton was saying, always have some duct tape with you. And we de determine how high it's supposed to be, duct tape to that bamboo stake, these wires, and deploy them that way. Okay. Wow. This is, this is, this is what happens when you let a, a professor that hasn't lectured in a while lecture. I said it would take a few minutes and I'm talking forever. Okay. Let's just finish up. So here, here's some examples of the stuff you guys see, right, on, on these traps. And so this is what you'll see five days in when it's time to pull in these traps. You'll see, um, you know, some little things, some big things, and we'll process them. You guys will process them. Again, you can see here why the saran wrap is going to be really helpful. And uh, this, it, if you do have a younger brother or a, a parent around or whatever, it might be great to ask them if they could give you a hand when it's time to pull these in. Solely because, um, as you can see here, um, the, the, the cleaner the, the, the saran wrap is on this surface, the easier it is to process. If you screw it up and it, and, it, and it crinkles, you can still process it. It'll just take you a lot longer. So it really, really is helpful if you have someone hold the bottom and then you pull it really tight and go like that, and then you just kind of wrap it over the other side. If you screw it up, it's, it's no big deal. But as you can see here on the picture on the left, it's way, way easier if it's nice and flat. And so what, you, what we'll do next week, what we'll talk about next week is how you process these. And so, so 
everybody has their favorite technique. As you see in this picture, some students have taken a Sharpie and made a grid on their, on their trap so that they, they can you know, go grid to grid to grid, great. On the left, you see some students have gone and circled certain ones that they wanted to enumerate, and, and it's up to you. It's, it's who, whatever your, your fastest technique is. The one thing that will be helpful and something we were not able to send you guys is a magnifying glass. If you guys have a magnifying glass or can get one, I'd strongly recommend that. If not, you can use your phone. You can use your phone as a bit of a magnifying glass, and that's fine. And, and we will have you guys take pictures of these things just so we can have that. But, but from a practical sense, if you guys can possibly have a um, – a, everybody probably has a ruler at home, but if you, if you guys don't have a magnifying glass, if you could maybe in the next week or so see if you can scrounge one up, even for just a day, that would be uh, not required, but that would be helpful. Um, obviously, in the lab, we can also use a dissecting scope, but, but you, you don't need one. would be helpful if you had one, but you don't need one. And I'm just going to end here with uh, uh, about... Um, a little bit so you guys have an understanding about what we're doing here. So, so again, ants, how many ants did we see? How many mosquitoes, things that are easy to bin, we'll, we'll do that. But the main value, the main target of this assessment is not diversity. The main metric that we're using these sticky traps for is productivity. And so what that means is we're trying to get biomass weight grams per unit area, and you guys will measure each of your traps, so per unit area, per time. And so what we've done here, this is, this is an example of a data sheet, and, and again, we'll, I'll give you guys these data sheets later, but, but um, we've done all the hard work, which is we've gone out and captured a bunch of insects, uh, hand-netted insects, and then killed them immediately, because again, biologists kill things, kill things, and then immediately go right back to the lab and weighed them. So we have fresh weight. And so we turns out we, we've come up with these five size categories of critters. There's, there's no theory behind it. This is all um, um, driven by practicality. Okay, So this is all the patterns that we've seen in, in coastal California, and they hold up in Asia and, and various places. But we have these sizes, and these are the maximum length. This is the maximum length of one of these critters. Okay, and so so we've gotten we we've collected individuals that are size class A, size class B, size class C, and we've gotten the average fresh weight of them. So you guys don't have to do any weighing. You guys don't have to do any any of that. You just are going to count up how many individuals are of size class A. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, how many individuals of size class B? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, twenty, nine, thirty-five etc. And then you'll throw it in the Excel spreadsheet and out will come the biomass that, and, and you can do all kinds of fancy statistics with it, but the, but the summation will be the total amount of biomass that comes out of this. You can use that as your core metric or if you were particularly worried about the birds in your backyard, the 0 0.5 millimeter size guys, birds aren't eating those. Birds are eating the big honking juicy moths and things. So you can say, hey, what's What's the size, of, you know, what's the biomass of potential food for butterflies? Similarly, with spiders, if you're interested in spiders, spiders are probably not going to be eating these huge, giant-sized bugs, right? It's too big for them. They would get through their net, through their um, webs, excuse me. So, so you, can, you can tune this in for the ec ecological uh, concern or interest of yours, but the main thing we're doing is just looking at total biomass. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so anyway, so th those are our two techniques. So we're going to do pitfall traps. And we're going to do aerial uh, insect traps. As we end here, I just want to um, emphasize to you guys that we really do want these. And I should say, if if, if we had unlimited budgets and whatever, um, and you guys have four zones, it would have been great to send you guys 12 of these traps, right? So we always would like to have some replicates within each of our sub areas. For logistics reasons, that, that that's that's too much right now. But But you want to make sure that the sites you're picking are representative of your overall yard or, or area. We want it to be robust enough so that we can actually compare things. So we want we want sample sizes that we have replication. So typically, if we were doing a backyard or, or a, a, a habitat, a community, we'd want no less than three replicates of each of these things, be it a pitfall trap, be it an aerial trap, at least, if not more. 
And then the third thing, which is what we've spent most of the time talking about is, is, is this technique doable? So, so can I get it done? Can I get it done under time? Can I get it done with the person power that I have at my disposal? Can I get it done with the constraints of the environment um, in, in, a, in a realistic um, sense? So, so what are the logistics of this methodology?